Hi, everybody. My name is Shiri Doria Hakoen. I'm the CEO and co founder of OCode and principal at SDH Consulting. And I'm here to talk to you today about passing the Turing test when, why, and how. You can tweet at me at any time during this talk with my uh, Twitter username in the corner here. So many of us know that Alan Turing was a famous computer scientist who also solved the enigma, among other things. And one of the things he's very famous for is proposing the Turing test. The Turing test was actually first proposed as a version on a common party game at the time in which men and women had to pretend to be from the other gender and the judge had to decide who was the man and who was the woman. The goal in the Turing test was to set a test for whether computers can actually think like humans do. And so the design is, can a computer pretend to be human well enough to fool a judge? The current incarnation of the Turing test is known as the Loebner Prize, which is run every year in which human judges have to decide between human confederates and their artificial intelligent counterparts. The computer who wins the most votes gets the title of most human computer. And if they fool a judge, if they fool all the judges to think that they are human more than a human does, then they will actually win the full prize and will be considered to pass the Turing test. Now you might ask yourself if anybody has ever passed the Turing test. Uh, in 2014, there were quite a few stories and claims about a chatbot called Eugene Guzman, who was simulating a 13-year-old Ukrainian boy being claimed to pass the Turing test by fooling 30% of the judges. But that claim has been widely criticized, and for good reason. They, basically, Eugene Guzman didn't actually pass the Turing test. It only crossed the threshold of fooling 30%, which was mentioned by Turing as a benchmark for something that computers might be able to do by the year 2000. But that does not that is not considered by most of scholars to be actually passing the Turing test. More than that, um, Eugene Guzman was sort of passing the Turing test in a way by cheating in, in the sense of claiming to be a young boy who didn't know English very well, but he wasn't actually conversing in well-versed English. So that's been argued very heavily, but really uh, it wasn't the Loebner Prize that Eugene Guzman actually won. It was a different test that was performed under less rigorous conditions. And so most people consider the Turing test to have never been passed. However, that's just referring to the official Turing test. There's also uh, what I would refer to as the unofficial Turing test, which is, can you fool anybody to think that you're a human? And the first Turing test arguably, uh, unofficially, was passed by ELIZA, the world's first chatbot that was designed in 1966 by Joseph Weizenbaum. ELIZA was designed to behave like a Rogerian therapist. So if you said anything, she would say, well, how does that make you feel? And it was basically parroting back a lot of the language back to the user. So the, the bot really wasn't that sophisticated, but it was the world's first chatter bot or chat bot as we know them today. There was no artificial intelligence involved per se. It was not as we know it today. It was pattern matching based only. And in a way, very surprisingly, uh, the, the story goes that Weizenbaum shared Eliza with his secretary as a test, and the goal was to see if Eliza was doing any good. After a few rounds, the secretary asked Weizenbaum to leave the room because she wanted to speak to the therapist. And so uh, we can see that even after Weizenbaum told people, no, this is not a real human, they actually had a hard time believing him. And they uh, bared their soul in front of Eliza. And even when the creator said it was a bot, some of them still thought it was actually a human and he was just pulling their leg. And Eliza is not by any means the only bot to ever pass this unofficial Turing test. In the late 1980s, a gentleman named Mark Humphreys, who was a computer science student, uh, tricked somebody 
into uh, conversing with a chatbot for over an hour. It was an accident. He wrote this chatbot for fun. He hooked it up to his online username to respond whenever he was away from the computer. And at some point, somebody signed on, was talking to this chatbot for over an hour, and uh, arguably thought that it was human. So uh, basically, how did he do that? The chatbot was basically a troll. So no matter what the human was saying to it, it would respond with curse words and talking about sex and saying, shut up and uh, basically arguing with the human. And so we have a, a first version of the chatbot troll, but the element of surprise was a really strong part here in, in this unofficial Turing test because essentially the human who was on the other side of this chat, and to this day we don't know who that person was, they did not expect to be speaking with a chatbot and therefore they assumed that it was a human. Robert Epstein, who is the co-founder of the Loebner Prize competition, was actually duped by four months by a chatbot he met online on a dating app. And in writing about this, he actually said, I certainly should have known better. Uh, but the reality is that oftentimes we don't expect to see a bot. And so we ascribe human characteristics, even when a chatbot is behaving in ways that might not be extremely intelligent, but they're behaving intelligently enough that we think that they're human. And it's not a, a coincidence that Robert Epstein fell for a dating bot. There are any number of dating and or sex bots out there in the wild right now, and people interact with them all the time, and some people do actually think they are speaking with humans. So in that respect, we are actually crossing that threshold of the unofficial Turing test in, at any moment. Now, speaking of sex bots, uh, not all of them are negative in nature. So Slutbot is a sex bot that was released by a company called Juicebox, and it's a sex positive chatbot coach. Now, by announcing out and out that it's a bot, it avoids what's called the uncanny valley. The uncanny valley is the level at which humans expect to see human behavior from a robot and then get kind of weirded out when the robot behaves in ways that are almost human but not quite. Now by explicitly saying, hey, I'm a bot, the slut bot actually circumvents this entire problem. Uh, and slut bot doesn't actually, at this point, does not actually use really complex AI. However, it uses erotica stories to tell a very, very compelling story. And it's written in a way that actually helps improve people's lives because it teaches people how to improve their own sex lives. And the other trick that Slutbot creators use is they write answers that actually work for a large percent of what a user is expected to respond. And so uh, I will not show you the video here because that would not be safe for work, but you can certainly Google it and find it on your own. And uh, one of the users in the Slutbot trailer says kind of embarrassingly, uh, well, it's obviously fake, but like it's still kind of hot to have someone be so open sexually. Of course, even the users who know that this is a bot can actually get turned on. And that is fascinating. I'd like to give you a framework here for how to think about bots in general. Uh, so these are dimensions that can be applied to any bot in any conversations. The first dimension is whether the bot is covert or overt. Is it trying to hide the fact that it's a bot? Or does it openly express, hey, I'm a bot? Uh, second is, is it human sounding or not? And really, uh, that is what we think of when we think of passing the Turing test. And we'll talk about that in a second. Um, there's also the question of adding value. Now, this entire conference is premised on the notion that bots add value to their users or can add value to both their users and their creators. But not all bots do that, as demonstrated by the bots that tricked Robert Epstein into dating it for four months. Um, so some bots add value and some bots detract value. And by the way, they can detract and add value to the creator of the bot or to the user of the bot, and sometimes those are not aligned. And finally, there's a question of open domain or domain specific. So if we look at the Turing test, in order to pass the Turing test, 
A bot has to be covert, very human sounding, and extremely open domain. At some point, the Loebner Prize actually had a closed domain, a domain specific test, but they changed that. And note that the Turing test is completely agnostic about the value being added, although naturally it's easier if you make the judge feel good. As for the example of Slutbot, it is openly happy to express the fact that it's bot, but it's very human sounding because it's being written by real humans and there's a script that was written by experienced erotica authors. It adds value to both the creator and the user but is very domain specific. If you try to talk to it about something that's not sex, it will not have a good time with that. Um, now, in my company in OCode, we actually aim to detect social media and propaganda disinformation bots. Those are the bots that are on Twitter and Facebook and spreading lies online. Um, so those bots attempt to be covert. They're quite human sounding, although not always. And their goal is to add value to their creator, but not necessarily to the user. And they're very domain specific. If we look at a different example, we can think of a customer service human who has a prescribed script that they have to follow. So they're actually human, but it doesn't feel that way. They feel very robotic in a way and arguably detracting value from the user. We could talk about whether or not they add value to the creator. And in any case, they're very domain specific. So if we only zero in for a second on the question of the value to the human uh, conversant, the user versus the creator, we can see this two by two quadrant where we have uh, bots that are fooling a person for gain, whether it's monetary or political, and they may be creating value for their creator, but detracting from their user. Uh, we've got, you know, the AI level three bots that we want to target here in this conference. And then we have, uh, you know, an interesting edge case here, which could be, for example, a failed customer service chatbot. Maybe it gives money away to customers and therefore it's creating value for the humans involved, but detracting from the value to the creator. And then in the negative on both sides, we have uh, bots like Tay, who became uh, racist and actually hurt Microsoft brands. So there was no, um, no value to either the human user or the creator, unless you were a troll trying to trick Microsoft into uh, being a neo-Nazi uh, bot, in which case you definitely succeeded. I propose a, a fourth, a, an additional test, actually, in, separately from the Turing test, and that's the trust test. Does a person trust their conversational partner enough to reveal sensitive information? And that can be asked whether or not that is a bot. So that question can be asked about a human partner of conversation or a bot partner. As for the Loebner Prize, I highly recommend checking out a book called The Most Human Human, written by Brian Christian, a poet with degrees in computer science and philosophy. So when you try to compete the Confederates in the Loebner Prize actually compete for a prize called the Most Human Human. It's an essentially a side effect of the Turing test. And Brian Christian set out to win this prize, and this is the book he wrote about it. Super interesting. Uh, and if you read the book, we actually get a few practical tips on how to improve our chatbots. So Brian Christian talks about site specificity, this notion of here and now. So for example, if the Loebner Prize was delayed by 10 minutes, he could refer to it in the conversation and sound more human because most bots wouldn't adapt as quickly. There's also this notion of being almost an anti-expert. Uh, the open domain-ness of a Turing test means you can't just zero in on one particular conversation. And there's also an idea that he mentions about the conversation staying in book, quote unquote, versus out of book. So if you're only using a script like Slutbot, that would be considered to be in book. Uh, whereas if you were creating items on the fly, that would be out of book. And those are terms that came from the world of chess. There's really an arms race here. The better we get at detecting bots, the better the bots will have to get in order to fool us. And the better the bots get, the harder it is to prove that uh, a human is a human in the Turing test versus a bot. Now, uh, Google released Mina 
in 2020, which is their their uh, open domain chatbot. And I know there's a talk here at this conference from Google about Mina. So keep an eye out for 2020's September Loebner Prize. It'll be very interesting to see if using Google's deep learning algorithms that have already surpassed the best human Go players, they'll be able to finally win the Turing test. And if not this year, maybe in the coming years. I'd like to close with the notion of Tesla's theorem, also known as the AI effect. So uh, Tesla was a computer scientist who said that intelligence is whatever machines haven't done yet. So if you think of artificial intelligence as a rising tide, and these islands are the parts that only humans can do. As the water level goes up and up, there's less and less things that only humans can do. But the more we cover, the less excited we are. So uh, once my prediction here is that once the Turing test of conversation actually has been passed, it will stop being considered a test of intelligence as Alan Turing originally intended it to be. And we'll start looking at alternative Turing tests that will show us that conversation isn't really the final frontier. We'll be looking at robots and trying to emulate robots in voice and not just in text and so on. Thank you so much, and I look forward to your questions.